mind spends a lot of its time talking to itself. And so when we come to the practice, it's important that we learn how to use that habit in a skillful way so it actually helps the practice. It doesn't get in the way. And if you read any of the texts, you know that when the mind gets into deep concentration, the sentences and dialogues that go in the mind get pared down really far to the point where there's just a mental note, like infinite space, the sun you have, infinite consciousness. That's all the talking that's going on in the mind. And if you feel harassed by all the chatter going on in the mind, it sounds pretty good. Just hold on to one thought, one object. You can get away from all the, the torment of what's being said inside the mind. But you can't get there until you've learned how to train the mind how to talk to itself. What sorts of things are important to talk about, what sort of things are not, what attitude to take. And unfortunately for most of us, we've learned lots of unskillful ways of talking. If it's not from our family, then it's from school or from the media. We talk about all the wrong topics, or if we talk about ways that actually discourage us from practicing. Either specific ideas about ourselves or attitudes in general. And one of the most virulent attitudes around is that the only way you're going to find happiness is through sensual indulgence. You can cite Freud, you can cite all these other psychotherapists as authorities, but then again, what kind of authority are they? It just so happens that their opinions fit in with the needs of the economy. And so those thoughts get pounded into our heads again and again and again or their idea of what's important to talk about. So we've got to learn how to retrain these voices in our minds, what sort of issues are important to talk about and what sort of issues are important to just leave aside. And as for the important issues to talk about, how do you talk about them? How do you encourage yourself in the practice? The Buddha recommends ten topics for recollection for the purpose of giving you energy, counteracting any unskillful chatter in the mind and replacing it with skillful chatter. You can recollect the Buddha to remind yourself that it is possible to find true happiness through human effort. Because after all, when the Buddha talked about his awakening, he didn't say it was because he was some special being beamed down from the sky. He simply developed qualities of the mind that all of us have in potential form. So that raises our sights as to what we can do with our lives. You can think about the Dharma and that it recommends a totally harmless form of happiness, a happiness that doesn't pose any danger to you, doesn't pose any danger to anybody else, it doesn't harm anybody. This is why they recommend that when monks are in the forest and they start getting scared about the dangers in the forest, the animals. the people who might be lurking in the wilderness, the diseases that can come, the fact that you're far away from doctors, anything of any comfort. 
You simply remind yourself you're there in a totally harmless way. And that can give you confidence. You can recollect the Sangha. If comparing yourself to the Buddha seems like a far stretch, you can think, well, there were people who studied with the Buddha who were really like us. In some cases, a lot worse off than we are right now. And yet they were able to pull themselves together, gain awakening. So these are recollections to overcome fear and lack of self-esteem. Similarly with the recollection of your virtue and the recollection of your generosity. Times you, in the past when you could have harmed somebody or done something against your principles, but you decided not to. Your principles were more important. Think about that. And then you have worth as a human being because of that. And the same when you were generous. For many of us, our first real experience of freedom was when we realized we could give something to somebody else, not because we had to, or it was their birthday, or it was Christmas, or anything, simply because you wanted to share. Something you could have used yourself, but you said, no, I'll give it to somebody else. It's good to reflect on that. You can think about the qualities that would make you a deva. Things like a sense of shame at the idea of doing something really harmful, other good qualities of the mind. You have those to at least to some extent, so reflect on that. Again, these reflections are meant to give you a sense of self-confidence, self-esteem, to remind you that even though you may have done a lot of unskillful things in the past, you do have your unskillful potentials. And it's up to you to decide which past actions are the important actions in your life story. We mentioned this a little bit this morning, that we all have a mixed bag in the past. You can think about this as if someone were writing your life story. And if you decide to stick with a skillful path, that means that the skillful qualities you had in the past are the important ones. If you stray away from the skillful path, that means the unskillful qualities, the unskillful things you did in the past are the important ones. So as you shape the present, you're not only shaping the present, but also highlighting different things in your past. So why not highlight the good things? Or if you start focusing on the bad ones, you say, well, at least I had some good qualities in the past, and those are the ones that eventually won out. At least they're winning out right now. And if there's part of your mind that says, well, they may win out right now, but they're going to lose out further down the line, you say, I don't care about further down the line. I want to make sure that at least right now I make the right choice. So at least there's a little uptick. in the general line of your life. And once you've decided to do that once, and you can do it again, and you can do it again until it becomes a habit. Then there are the reflections to make sure that you don't be heedless or complacent. There's a recollection of death fact that it could come at any time, and that you've got to re prepare, because death isn't the end. As long as there's craving in the mind, it jumps on to another life. The image the Buddha gave is of a fire that is burning one house, and then it jumps across to another house, burns the next house, and then the next. And so what kind of house are you going to? And the image kind of breaks down here. but. The craving is what pulls you on. What kind of cravings are you nurturing in your mind right now? What would cravings would be more skillful to nurture? What habits do you want to take with you as you go on? You realize there's work to be done in the mind. You can't just 
put it off to tomorrow or the next day or next week or next month or next year. Because you don't know if you have a next day or a next month or next year. But you do know that you have right now, this breath coming in right now. If it so happened that you suddenly died right now, wouldn't you prefer to be in a moment of mindfulness and alertness rather than wandering out around thinking about who knows what? So that's a recollection to make you more heedful, to help overcome laziness. This mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness immersed in the body. Mindfulness immersed in the body is to help you remember, do you want to be come back? Do you want to be coming back as a human being, or would you rather come back as something better? And there's always that issue of death when people are really possessive of their bodies. Then you come back and just kind of be a spirit hovering around a dead body. Would you like to do that? This body may seem okay while it's alive, but when it's dead, it's really not that attractive a place to be. Can you learn how to develop a sense of detachment from your own body so you're not afraid to let it go when you have to? And then mindfulness of the breath is the practice for developing all those good qualities that you need. Mindfulness, alertness, ardency, concentration, discernment. This is the recollection that you can make your home. And then finally, this recollection of peace, actually the peace of nirvana, reminding yourself that this is really the direction you want to go in, if possible. That there is an attainment of true happiness. And it's in that direction where true happiness lies, so you don't get distracted by other, other ideas about happiness. So if you find yourself having trouble settling down with the breath, you've got these other topics you can think about as well. They should always be there in the background so that you can draw on them when you need them. As long as the mind needs to think, have it think about something that's really useful, as long as it's going to talk to itself, make sure the conversation is actually a skillful conversation. You know, spend all your time in views without any vision. It's a distinction the Buddha makes in the, the Metta Sutta. It's just not taking the views, but consummate in vision. We spend most of our time talking about, I think this about that, I think that about this, this is my opinion on politics, this is my opinion on the Michael Jackson feeding fest and the media, I mean, whatever. But does it really matter? A while back I was reading Mark Twain's autobiography, and occasionally he talks about political issues of the day. And it's really the least interesting part about Mark Twain. His more interesting opinions are the ones about sort of the universals of human nature. You should have that attitude towards your own thoughts. Your really interesting thoughts are about the more universal things, particularly this issue of vision means that you actually see what the mind is doing, see how it's creating suffering for itself. And this may not be a topic that you can talk about with other people, but at least it doesn't lead to controversy. As the Buddha said, the, the source of all conflicts in the world comes from a type of thinking he calls papancha, mental proliferation, where your thoughts just 
get out of control to the point where they come back and attack you. I.e., they put you into difficulties, they create trouble for you. And these thoughts come from one basic notion, I am the thinker. You want to establish your identity through your opinions about things. And the Buddha did not encourage this kind of thinking. Questions that come from this, you know, who am I, what am I, what will I be? That, he said, is the kind of questioning that's inappropriate if you really don't want to put an end to suffering, because it gets you more tied up with views and opinions. For instance, the question about what happens to an awakened person after death. Does the person exist, not exist, both, neither? And if you're asking that because you're worried, what's going to happen to this I who's been thinking? The Buddha wouldn't answer the question. He didn't want to encourage that kind of thinking. He wanted to encourage the kind of thinking that looks at, is there suffering here right now? What am I doing that's causing the suffering? What can I do to put an end to it? It's interesting to reflect that here we are learning about ourselves through meditation. But you ask yourself, what kind of self-knowledge is this? The question, who am I, what am I, what was I in the past, what am I going to be in the future? Those questions the Buddha said to put aside. The self-knowledge he was more interested in is, what am I doing right now? What are the results of what I'm doing? What, when I do it, will be skillful? In other words, leading to good results. What, when I do it, will be unskillful, leading to harmful results? What will be for my long-term suffering? What will be for my long-term happiness? Those kind of questions are worth asking. In other words, seeing yourself as having the power to create long-term happiness. And then ask yourself, how can I develop that potential? But also seeing that you have the potential of creating a lot of harm and suffering. How can you avoid that potential? That kind of self-knowledge, that's vision, and that's really useful. It's unfortunate our society encourages us to have views about things. It doesn't encourage much vision. But you can train yourself. You're not simply a, a product of social pressures and social influences. Because there's something that really is totally yours, which is suffering. No one else can experience your suffering. Nobody else knows how much you suffer or how you suffer. That's something you can know. As the Buddha points out, you can also learn how not to suffer. That's the kind of self-knowledge. It's vision. And you have the freedom to develop that if you want. 